Um, so what I'd like to talk about today are four things. First, I'd like to start by just recapping very briefly uh, some of the pressures that have arisen over the last few decades that have really um, set the stage and, and caused us to feel a sense of urgency and immediacy for wanting to create meaningful change in, in this sometimes uh, traditional and slow moving, often slow moving arena. Um, second, I'm going to look at one of the, the sort of major uh, potential solutions that are, that's arisen from these pressures, uh, and that's the move towards open writ large and open access in specific. Um, I also want to look at uh, some of the challenges and opportunities that are coming out of the open access environment in terms of new ways for us to think about accessing, using, and evaluating research. And because Spark is a catalyst for action, I'll close with three suggestions for actions that I think are really high on our collective agenda as a community for uh, the upcoming months and year. So what's happening in terms of the pressures that are on the marketplace? These are going to look very familiar to all of you. None of them are really going to be a surprise, but I think they're, they're worth going through quickly to, to kind of look at the cumulative effect. So we have new technologies, particularly the internet, right? We have the opportunity with the internet and the web to communicate the results of the work that we do and communicate with one another at the push of a button and to reach an enormous audience that was beyond our reach in the print environment sort of attendant to this move with the internet, we've seen these online arenas and communities spring up, opportunities for us to talk as not only individuals, but also as scholars and scholarly communities, research divisions in new places. We see scholars having conversations on the web about their work that mirror conversations that used to only be able to take place in the hallways at meetings or in the hallways of our institutions. We see discussions of articles and uh, research threads on Twitter and Facebook and in just whole new places than, than we've seen them before. Um, most strikingly, we see the younger generation of researchers completely communicating in the digital environment. The mode and the mechanism for how we share our thoughts about our work and what we're working on have completely changed. Kind of makes sense that sort of moving into the digital environment brings with it um, not only communicating the results of what we're doing, but also kind of doing our work in new ways in the digital environment. As fields move into the digital environment, you know, no surprise here, right? More digital information is created. What I think is really interesting and important to know is the scale and the scope and the pace of the, the amount of digital information that we're being asked to deal with. And I love this slide, which I've borrowed from uh, Elias Zerhouni, who was the uh, director of the National Institutes of Health. And Dr. Zerhouni was using this slide to try to illustrate to Congress uh, the pace and the scale and the scope of uh, uh, the, the creation of digital information in the digital environment. And what this is is actually a slide that represents um, the, the information that came out of the beginning of the Human Genome Project. When the human genome was digitized in the first year, uh, we were able to, scientists were able to actually associate for the first time a disease-specific condition with a specific location on the genome. So that little piece right there is the, the disease-specific marker um, in the right place for macular degeneration. In 2006, because this information was now fully digitized, the amount of disease-specific markers went up, not, not doubled, but by a factor of four. In the first quarter of 2007, the same dynamic, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, first quarter of 2008, second quarter of 2008. You see the amount and you see the multiplier. It's not a linear trajectory. When a discipline moves into a digital environment, it, the, the growth is exponential. And this is the curve tracking uh, 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 submissions to GenBank over the same time period uh, as the Human Genome Project was digitized. But it's important to note that this curve exists in every field that starts to move into the digital environment, from digital humanities to social sciences, you name the discipline, you'll see this hockey stick curve repeated over and over again. The amount of information generated makes it impossible for us to consider kind of moving, continuing to move along in the mode of understanding and digesting, making sense of this information that we've become so used to doing, right? We think about the papers that are, that are uh, attendant to this, just this particular discipline. The amount of papers that report on, on genetics over this period, if we think about sitting and reading them you know, one by one, or thinking that we're going to be able to somehow linearly plow through them just using our human brain, we're, we're, we're lost, right? We're not, gonna, we're not gonna optimize our ability to learn that way, to make discoveries, uh, and to, to you know, keep moving 
uh, the knowledge ball down the field, if you will. So one of the things that's crucial uh, and that we need to think about um, is the pressure that comes along with having the amount of digital information that we need to deal with is that we need to really think about enabling computers as a new class of readers to help us make sense of this environment. And that's a really important point as we think about how uh, open access in the scholarly communications world um, is changing. So please keep that in mind as we go forward. And the last pressure, the librarians in the room will recognize this. Sadly, it is not the title of a new Ang Lee movie. Um, it is rising costs, shrinking budgets. Um, the costs of information, particularly for in the journal realm, uh, is, is, has been increasing rapidly and has been accumulating, over, the, those costs have been accumulating over decades at paces that we simply can't keep up with. For those of you who are not librarians, it, it, the, the, the price barriers may not be obvious, but they're very, very real. Um, the, the, the cost of getting access to a scholarly journal, and this is leasing access to a year's worth of articles in an issue, are significant. Your librarian can get you access to a year's worth of articles in a journal like the Journal of Econometrics for the same price that you can buy outright a new computer for one of your classrooms. Or the, the Journal of Geological Review for the, the same price as you can get a diamond ring. And heaven forfend you have neuroscientists on your campus and you need brain research, you can get a year's access, lease a year's access to the, the papers, or you can buy a nice Honda Accord outright. Significant, significant costs. And this translates into significant pressures on your institution's ability to be able to deliver to students, to faculty, to anybody who wants it, access to the kinds of, of, of information that you need to do your research. This is a graph that was shared by the, the libraries at MIT, right? one of the best funded private libraries. And you don't even need to, to, to look at the numbers. All you need to look at is the journal expenditure line going up, you know, red line towards the sky, while the library budget and the, the pace of inflation kind of continue along on this sort of flat trajectory. And you realize that in our little modern interpretive dance of journal pricing, this giant gaping massive hole in the middle is the, the, the gap between what the library wants to be able to provide you and what they can, can afford to be able to provide you in terms of journals. Um, cumulative, right? So the, the, the this individual prices uh, are expensive. They're going up year in and year out on that steep trajectory. And what we see suddenly is that journals are big business. Um, STM, the STM journal publishing market is roughly a nine billion, with a B, dollar a year revenue producing industry. And just to put it in perspective, another $9 billion a year revenue producing industry is the National Football League. We're talking big, big business in our little sleepy academic publishing scholarly uh, backwater. So it, when, you're, when you want to create change and when you're talking about meaningful, creating meaningful change, you're talking about trying to turn the Queen Mary around and you know, retrofit it to be a, a boat that can, that can you know, explore Mars. That's what it feels like sometimes in terms of the scope and the scale. So you may be thinking, okay, so what does this actually mean for me as an individual? We know these pressures are out there. We're all familiar with new technology, lots of data, and you may be um, aware that there's uh, uh, price pressure out there. What does it mean for you on a daily basis? It's really interesting when um, at Spark we come to campuses and we'll talk to researchers and say, you know, how are you doing in terms, how are you feeling about getting access to articles? In general, people will look at us and say, but we're fine. My institution does a, does a, does a good job of, of getting me access to what I need. And so we tend to probe a little bit and ask the question, so you mean you've never run into this scenario where you're doing a search for an article on a topic that, uh, that you're interested in? And we all use Google even though we, we don't like to admit it. Uh, it's usually our starting point. You come across the abstract of an article that you think you might be interested in reading. You click on the link to the full text and you come up against the paywall that says, to, to read the, the text to see if this is something you might want, um, pony up $31 because your institution doesn't have a subscription to it. And everyone does what most of you are doing right now. They're like, yep, that happens all the time. So we say, so what do you do about it, right? What, what, what's your action? Um, as much as we would like it in the library community to be in our library alone, that's not what people do, right? What we hear frequently is, uh, I ask the author for a copy. I get it from a colleague at an institution who has a subscription. Some of the more creative among you are using hashtags like I can has PDF, putting in the URL and asking your colleagues to ship you the PDF. Right? We have this little burgeoning black market of PDFs out there. And then people go, oh, wait a minute, that, that's just wrong. That's not, that's not the right way to be. 
you think we think we have that the status quo is okay, but in reality, we've become completely dependent on and used to workarounds to get access to the information that we need. So what we really need to think about doing is optimizing the system for all of us, right? For scholars, for researchers, for the academy. And that brings us to the concept of open access and why it was actually created. Um, in 2002, uh, a, group, a, a, a group of a wide variety of thinkers in uh, uh, academic disciplines got together and said, well, let's, you know, let's think about this issue. If we could recreate a system from the ground floor up of sharing scholarship with one another, what would the characteristics of those system look like? What would, what would we create if we you know, had sort of carte blanche? And the idea of open access was born out of that. Um, so what we're talking about specifically, when we're talking about open access and at Spark, we use this definition like it's the Bible um, of open access. By open access, we mean the free immediate avail availability of articles online coupled with the rights to use them fully in the digital environment. Um, we don't want to just end up with a world where we can access articles and simply read them. We want to be able to download them individually or in bulk. We want to be able to copy them, index them, crawl them, text mine them, data mine them, do any of the myriad kinds of things we can't even think about yet that we might want to do in the electronic environment. We want to fully enable uh, 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 the, the, the information in these articles uh, to, to its optimal degree. So when we talk about open access going forward in the conference and going forward certainly in this talk, really think about the twin pillars of the definition. Immediate access coupled with full reuse rights. So how are we doing? Um, you know, uh, we, we had this idea about 11 years ago. So any progress towards making this vision any closer to a reality? Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to do this part of the talk, especially this week in particular. Uh, there's three areas where, I think I, where I'd like to highlight uh, that are critical pieces of infrastructure. And Rick couldn't have set it up better for me in terms of uh, highlighting the areas of infrastructure that, that really give us uh, clear indicators of sort of the state of the art. And the first is, if we're talking about enabling uh, an open access journal publishing environment, we've got to have a robust set of options for scholars to publish in. And as of this morning, the Directory of Open Access Journals listed more than 8,600 uh, open access journals that meet the full criteria of OA in any, every discipline that you can think of um, coming from publishers around the world. When we first started talking about this a decade ago, there were you know, a couple dozen. So the growth has been pretty amazing. And the growth in quality has been just as important. Um, this slide I now change on like a monthly basis. And I try to, to highlight new high quality entrants into the, the open access journal marketplace. We had Elementa just a few weeks ago come in in the ecology sector. The PeerJ in the basic biological sciences sector in January. eLife in the biomedical disciplines in December. Uh, the Open Humanities Alliance launching its open, journal, open access journal incubator um, late last fall. So the, it's not just numbers of journals that, that are available that, that is an encouraging sign. It's the quality of those journals. It's also really interesting to see that the, the growth in open access journals isn't limited to new players. Just earlier this week, uh, Nature Publishing Group announced that it had purchased Front, the Frontiers series, which is a, a, a series of open access journals. So Nature, who had been um, one of the more outspoken publishing organizations who were very skeptical of open access, have made the business decision that they were going to bet on open access by, by uh, uh, purchasing a, a suite of journals. This morning there was an uh, editorial about this in The Economist, in fact. And I thought it was really interesting that uh, the, the title was Changing Nature under the heading of Scientific Publishing. It could have been, you know, one title, The Changing Nature of Scientific Publishing, like just using nature as the illustration. Nature's motivations are a little different than, because they're a commercial publisher, than, you know, scholarly societies or startups coming out of the academy. They see that there's a profit to be made. And this is a little quote from the editorial this morning that uh, the, uh, the estimates now are that open access journals last year generated about $172 million in revenue seems kind of paltry against our NFL size, you know, marketplace. But I think the salient statistic here to look at is that the revenue from last year was, uh, this year, was up 34% over 2011. That growth rate is phenomenal. And I think that is where you're seeing 
economic indicators that say, not only do we have a robust number of journals, quality indicators are coming up, but we're also seeing proof of concept that this market is appealing, sustainable, um, scalable, and potentially even, heaven forfend, profitable. Hopefully to within a more reasonable degree than the subscription ac ac access marketplace, but a really important indicator to, to keep your eye on. In terms of author uptake, this curve is uh, one that looks kind of familiar right now in, in, in the open access environment. We had a slow start in getting authors to be comfortable um, and confident enough to choose to publish in open access journals. But over the last decade, um, and in particular in the last three to four years, we've really seen the uptake increase. Um, that's been very interesting in, in kind of mirroring, uh, watching those trends and, and looking at them across different disciplines and across journals. Um, there's been lots of research and a lot of uh, sort of prognostication done about, so will open access ultimately become the default mechanism? Is it, is it a possibility? And the most recent research that we've seen actually shows a fairly aggressive and optimistic scenario for when uh, the amount of articles that are published under uh, open access um, licensing conditions will overtake, will become 50%, 51% of the marketplace is now sort of within our, our, our realm. Um, the, the aggressive prediction is 2017. The more conservative prediction is now 2021 in biological science disciplines in particular. Um, that to me is almost, it was almost unthinkable. Like we, we wanted this to be reality, but to actually see the trend lines and to be able to, to look at the data and say, we're really moving in this direction is, um, is, is quite something. The second piece of, of infrastructure that we need to look at as an indicator of how we're doing, as Rick mentioned before, is open access repositories. Um, open uh, digital archives um, play a, a crucial role in providing a, a global fabric to ensure accessibility, interoperability, um, and long-term preservation of the results of research that are coming from our campuses, from our, our funding agencies. This is a mashup of Google Earth and uh, the Directory of Open Access Repositories. And what it illustrates is the more than 2,000 open repositories that now exist around the world, helping to provide a home not only for open access journals, but for individual articles who haven't found a home in an open access journal. And also for the materials that are attendant that are also produced out of research that create the ecosystem for research in the digital environment that articles are a critical component of like the data that's supplementary to the articles, and the data that the articles were based on. So think about the repositories as sort of the backbone of, or one of the backbones of our ability to um, uh, uh, make sure that the ecosystem of open scholarship has the, the broadest possible palette for us to work from across, globally, which is how we conduct uh, scholarship and research after all. And the third thing that I'll spend a little time uh, talking about in terms of critical components of infrastructure that give us an indicator of how we're doing is the policy framework. And the policy framework is important on three fronts. It's important on, on uh, the local institutional front, the national and the international front. Um, this is a, a and I love this, that this curve keeps showing up in you know, the indicators of open access. Like if the, if the curves were going down, I would probably be talking to you like, you know, hunched down over the computer, but it's really interesting to see the number of policies on all of these levels increasing um, uh, over the same time frame as uh, the, the journal uptake, uh, the implementation of repositories, et cetera. Um, on the local level, we've seen, uh, Rick gave a list of, of some of the, the, the institutions here in the United States that have implemented open access policies on campus, faculty driven, statements that essentially say we want open access to be the default for how we communicate our research on our campuses. Harvard was the first out of the box, but now there's an organization called the Coalition of Open, open Access Policy Institutions, or COPE, which uh, Lorraine Hercom, uh, who's here from KU, you'll hear from later, was instrumental in starting. And Lorraine let me know this morning that there are now 51 institutions in the US and Canada uh, that have active open access policies, faculty-driven policies that are members of this institution. So uh, a, a, a network that's really growing in terms of setting the policy default mode on campus to encourage open access um, behaviors to take root. 
internationally, it's been an incredibly busy year. We're seeing debates, uh, very public debates, discussions of um, how to implement, uh, how to develop, implement, and in some cases like the UK, uh, perfect open access policies or backslide, depending on how you look at the discussions at the moment. Um, really, uh, day, on a daily basis, discussions in the House of Lords, parliamentary committees being convened, um, consultations with stakeholders. In the UK, it's an incredibly active policy topic. Ditto in the European Commission. Um, the, the inclusion of open access as part of the research policy framework across Europe for the funding agencies that make up the European Commission. Uh, there's an open access policy that is um, uh, uh, being considered and will be either ratified, modified, something will happen with it by the end of this year. S similar things happening in Australia, similar things happening in Argentina where a new law was just introduced to make open access the default mode. Um, really a global policy environment where open access has taken center stage. So what about here in the US? How are we doing on that front? So for the longest time, the longest time, four years and six, seven months, we just had the NIH policy on the books. The National Institutes of Health is the only funding agency in the United States, albeit the largest, $30 billion of our $60 billion research investment goes through the NIH, that requires uh, their funded researchers to make articles reporting on their funded research openly accessible. Um, we'd had bills introduced into Congress and considered by Congress to look at um, uh, creating more avenues for public accessibility of, of uh, articles funded by other funding agencies. Very useful, got the conversation started, but uh, they had not been ratified into law. And then last week or two weeks ago on uh, Valentine's Day, a big step forward with Congress. This says Congress considering bills on access. The Federal Research Public Access Act, that was the bill that was sort of used as the let's get the ball rolling in the discussion of this, let's, let's raise this as a policy issue, was really a bill that talked about making sure the public could access, read um, articles that were uh, funded by public research. Um, but on February 14th, sort of son of FERPA, the, the faster bill was introduced into Congress that also put the, the issue of reuse rights squarely on the table. Um, a, a bill was introduced uh, called the Fair Access to Science and Technology Research Act in both the House and the Senate, identical language on the same day uh, by bipartisan co-sponsors. Like I think Washington ground to a halt because hell froze over when that happened. Um, calling for really uh, all federal agencies besides the NIH to, to put policies in place that required after six months after publication in a, a peer reviewed journal immediate accessibility to the articles, and for the agencies to really get serious about looking at enabling full reuse rights of those materials as well. So an enormous step forward, and this is a bill that's live in front of Congress right now. During the same time frame, this sort of four-year you know, derivation or four-year history of the, the uh, NIH policy, the White House was also looking at this issue. Um, when the Obama administration came into office, one of its first actions, you'll probably remember, was to issue an open government directive, which essentially talked about the need to uh, uh, ensure that, that information generated by the federal government was accessible, openly accessible to the American public. Great opportunity for them to consider open access as a policy. And they've been thinking on it for quite some time, right? Since they came into office, this is something that the Obama administration has been, uh, 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 my, my brother-in-law always says about his, his, his son, who's six months old, that when he gets that furrowed brow, he's cogitating on something. So they, they've been thinking about this thing. In 2009, they issued a call for public input, which we as a community and all you guys saw as a, as a call in the Federal Register to tell them what the community thinks should be done about ensuring public access. You responded admirably. Thousands of comments, public discussions on the White House blogs, just fantastic and substantive input from the community. So naturally, they did it again. It wasn't enough. In 2011, they issued yet another call for more public comments uh, while they continued to think about, think deep thoughts and have conversations with stakeholders like commercial publishers about whether or not this was a step that could be taken. Again, people responded like crazy with wonderful substantive comments. Uh, the White House expressed gratitude for the comments and kind of went away and was silent for a while. So we responded with comments, but we also followed up with action. 
Um, and though this sounds like the beginning of a bad joke, it's a lawyer, a publisher, a librarian, and a computer guru walked into the White House one day. Um, and this is myself, one of your speakers, Mike Carroll, um, uh, John Wilbanks, and Mike Rosner uh, representing said bad joke communities uh, to try to meet, with a, to meet with the president's science advisor to talk about this issue to see where things stood. And this was in May of last year. Um, it was clear from the meeting with the president's science advisor that the comments, that the discussions, that the thinking had resulted in the substance of the argument largely being accepted by the folks in the White House. They, they, they agreed that the, the, from a policy perspective and a principal perspective, this was something that should be done. Um, but in Washington, as I suspect everywhere in the world, um, policy is perception and policy is politics. So one of the things we knew we needed to do walking out of that meeting was to make sure that the White House got the message that from a politics and a perception standpoint, that there, were, there was an adequate number of people out there who felt passionately about this issue. So we utilized, um, as a community, the White House's We the People petition site and put up a petition requesting that the, the White House uh, issue a policy requiring public access to federally funded research. And the way the We the People site works is if you get 25,000 signatures, or worked then, 25,000 signatures within 30 days, the White House essentially owes you a response. So you guys responded in droves, and in 13 days, we had the requisite number of signatures, and in fact, ultimately garnered more than 65,000 individual signatures on the petition. The cumulative effect of this action, right, of, of it was not just that I, I like the fact that it was four people and we happen to represent these very unlikely, you know, partners in going in to talk to the White House, but there were loads of, of folks who made the visits to the White House, who, who, who had the conversations, who responded to the four years worth of calls for, for um, participation. And just Friday, the, the White House responded by doing two things, by saying, sending a, a note to everyone who signed the petition, basically saying, we heard you, and we are going to create a policy making public access to federally funded research um, a requirement. Uh, and then they issued a, a, a directive from John Holdren, the, the president's science advisor, requiring um, what, what numbers right now about 19 federal agencies and departments to develop plans um, and policies that will require that articles and data that result from public funding are made available um, uh, openly to the public. So just an enormous step forward to have the principle validated by the administration um, and validated in a very public way, huge. And not just huge here, right? The, the, the policy conversations that are happening in the United States, the, 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 the international conversations, look at what we're doing, we look at what they're doing, we ping pong back and forth. As soon as the policy came out, for example, Neely Cruz, who is um, a, a, a European commissioner for the digital agenda, who's one of the biggest open access advocates for the European Commission, sort of tweeted immediately, you know, new US announcement on open access means more alignment with our EU policy, good stuff. You know, they're looking at this, they're waiting. It's enormously helpful to keep the policy momentum uh, moving forward on, on a global scale. Um, additionally, Monday morning, the, the, the validation from other sources is, is sort of coming out and it's a little bit overwhelming. So on Monday morning, there was an editorial by the editorial board of the New York Times affirming uh, the White House's action and interestingly, um, saying it doesn't go far enough, you actually need to make stuff available faster and, and being a little bit more aggressive even than, than the White House was. So um, incredible activities happening on, on the policy front. So we should definitely celebrate right, the, the milestones that we have, not just in the policy arena, but in terms of the, the robustness of the infrastructure that's in place. And in fact, on Friday, we did. This is how open access advocates celebrate. We, we're, we're all over the place, so we rely on drinking via Skype together. It's, um, it's a little sad, a little pathetic. Let's go back to the best slide. But, but then we need to get back to work. And what I'd like to finish this talk with is just um, uh, uh, underscoring my colleague, John Wilbanks, who was, was uh, part of that visit to the White House and was really the driver behind getting the, the petition um, uh, up and running, uh, said in a blog post last night that the White House's action um, you know, and sort of the cumulative markers that we have isn't the end of our work in open access or even the beginning of the end. But it's at least the end of the beginning of our journey towards open access. And what we really need to concentrate on now collectively is the nuts and bolts, the implementation. How do we get it done and get it done right? 
I think we have two major challenges in front of us that we really need to get right. Um, PubMed Central, NIH's database, has two and a half million articles in it now, full text articles that you can get, that are freely available to, to access, to read. But only a quarter of those articles, 500,000, half a million, are available under full open access rights, where you can not only read them, but you can machine them, text mine them, download them, do all the kinds of things we want to do to be able to advance science and, and generate knowledge with them. So the, the, the reason that, that there, the, the majority of the articles are, 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 you're not able to do that with them is that they carry vestiges of the copyright regime from the print environment into the digital environment. And it's really important that we as a community become educated on and understand how to utilize open licenses that will enable us to be able to fully realize the vision of open access in terms of reuse. We're lucky we have Mike Carroll who's ducking right there underneath the screen. Wave to everybody. Hi, Mike. Mike is going to talk later exactly about this subject. He's probably, well, you're the guru on this. He's the person that, that you know, the movement, open access movement turns to for, for um, education and advice on how best to do this. I really do think ensuring full reuse rights is the next major battle that we have to, 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 to ensure that open access can uh, uh, become the default mode. It's hard. And we realize internally, even at Spark and the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association and PLOS, you know, folks who are working in this arena every day and who are looking at what do rights mean. So we actually had to kind of map it out for ourselves. And we've created this little pamphlet to help us figure out how open is it? When you look at an article, how do you know if it's open access or if it's not open access? How do you know? what rights are, go along with it, and how can you decide? Is this journal really an open access journal? Is this article really an open access article? So we've created in the How Open Is It, but it's just a, a, a brochure or a pamphlet that contains a matrix, and it's built on the seafood watch. You know, what, what's safe seafood and what's not safe seafood in terms of mercury and other kinds of schmeeby things that fish eat and end up in our food sources that, that lists the terms and conditions, and then you can kind of Use this as your guideline to try to figure out, is this really an open access journal, the full Budapest open access definition, or is it, does it fall somewhere else on the sorta open spectrum? A first step towards helping us figure out um, a, a, a rational way to, to start thinking through uh, the rights bundle. Why is this important? I think this is, this is something that's really critical to note. The details of the licensing can be overwhelming. But we want to think about why do we have to get it right? And I think we want to get it right because we want more of these moments. There was an a, a, a editorial in the Chronicle of Higher Ed that talked about uh, Jack Andreka, who is the 14-year-old student who won the Intel Science Fair this year by using open, openly available open access articles, open resources uh, to advance his thinking. And he, he was able to generate a new test to detect pancreatic cancer. It's like a $50 test and you can do it in like 13 seconds. So we want stories where they're success stories. You can get access, you know, you, you have a scientific discovery. I, I feel like that when I hear this story. I mean, this is the cutest kid on the face of the planet and was like actually in Michelle Obama's box at the inauguration. So he's like our little open access celebritan right now. He's pretty awesome. But we want to enable these discoveries, right? So Jack is one of the, the few stories we can point to that says when you have a reasonable corpus of open literature, Good stuff happens, discovery happens. In the data realm, we have these examples and we want them in the article realm as well, right? When researchers shared openly data on Alzheimer's research, they were able to identify gene markers in uh, leading towards uh, indicators towards Alzheimer's. And the Human Genome Project, it doesn't, the, the benefits of, of enabling this kind of reuse don't stop at scientific discovery and happy kids at the Intel Science Fair. They also help fuel the economy. When the Human Genome Project was not only digitized, but the data was made open, that $3.8 billion investment resulted in a return of about $800 billion in revenue back to, uh, back to the community and resulted in new opportunities to create over 300,000 jobs, right, as well as the added bonus of advancing science. So the, the idea of enabling reuse rights is hugely important in very concrete and very measurable ways. We want those stories. We don't want the stories of what happens and what can happen in a closed environment. And we all know that, you know, we had this example, this awful example 
of Aaron Schwartz, right, who was arrested for uh, being accused of, of bulk downloading, downloading, you know, millions of, or tens of thousands of articles from the JSTOR database um, in, uh, at, at MIT. We need to be able to download articles to be able to work on them. That shouldn't be a legal activity. We want, that, we want the happy ending. We don't want the Aaron endings for this. Reuse rights are crucial in being sure, in, in us being sure that we enable the kinds of endings and outcomes that we want. Major effort needed to educate pretty much everybody. Right? This is something that none of us are expert on. Students, faculty, administrators, policymakers across the board. So this is a pretty big task for us. And the last thing that I wanted to, to just, well, to get for open access to succeed, I tell my, I put this in as a reminder to myself as much as anything else. We have to get the rights right if we really want open access to truly succeed. And the last thing I wanted to touch on was um, the second major challenge I think we still have in front of us to make open access the default mode, and that's culture change. The toughest thing in the world is to get an individual to change their behavior and to move from behaviors that are traditional, publishing in the journal that you're used to, in the journal that you're told is the right journal, um, keeping the same copyright transfer form, not think, thinking about holding data rather than sharing data. And to, to, to get people to move in this environment, to, to get them over these hurdles, we need a better answer for why publish in an open access journal or why engage in an open behavior. We need a better answer for what's in it for me, for them individually. The biggest barrier for people adopting um, open access behaviors is their, honestly, their fear of not being rewarded ad ad adequately that the journal that they publish in will not be considered good enough in tenure and promotion or review or in um, funding evaluation processes. So we, we know we need to find better ways to reward people, but we're collectively not really that sure how we can do that. What do we look at? Right? We rely right now on one measure of impact and one measure of quality almost exclusively when we're making these decisions, journal impact factors. And that single, uh, a single indicator can never, never, never tell you the full story, and you're all familiar with the, uh, the, the, the shortcomings. Impact factors serve a, a useful purpose, but they should never be used the way they're being used as the single indicator of quality. The open digital environment lets us collect information on a lot more than just citations. It finally opens the door for us to think about what kind of information can we provide on to those folks who are, are tasked with making decisions about quality, impact, um, uh, uh, what, should they, what could they be looking at? Um, researchers should be able to define metrics that matter to them, and they should be evaluated on the kinds of metrics that are important to them. So that sounds great, but how do you do it? Well, in the open access environment, and this is something that we'll hear a lot more about from uh, the wonderful Jennifer Lynn, who's here from PLOS, which is the, the, uh, the publisher that actually um, is the innovator in, in establishing these things, article level metrics begin to open the door for us to think about answering this question. Um, they're metrics that measure a whole host of other things besides citations. And I won't go into details because I know Jen is going to um, uh, tell a much better story here, but what, what I do want you to think about in terms of the culture change not being a tough one to crack and trying to point to things that are meaningful to individuals about what, what's in it for you is thinking about what article level metrics let you do as an individual. They let you look at your work and the work of other people and dig into different aspects of that work, um, different aspects of, imp of impact besides simply citations. And you can think about what's, what's important to me as a researcher. It might actually be, I wonder who's reading my work. Article level metrics let you do that. You know, even if it's something like looking at, you know, who's talking about you on Twitter? Uh, it may be your friends, but it may be in this case, you know, the public health organization, malaria networks. It could be funders, right? It could be policymakers. The identity of who's using your work is all of a sudden something that can come into play. If you're a funder, right, think about that question. What's in it for me, open access? Um, you might be interested in I'm funding the research and I want to know what kind of an impact this work has in all of these different outcome areas. These are the criteria that, for example, the Wellcome Trust looks at when they make funding decisions. Uh, one area is um, influence and engagement. So if your article was cited on the front page of the, the New York Times uh, science section, it's not something that's gonna show up in the impact factor or citation index, 
but it will show up in article level metrics and it can be something that might be important in your conversation with decision makers about the impact of your work. So these, uh, these article level metrics might look new and different at first, but they open up opportunities for us and for others to see how work is used and who's using it. Tremendously important. They let you tell a fuller story about the impact of your research. Um, and when we think about it, might not those things, might, might they be important to tenure and promotion evaluators? So here we are, and I'm gonna just close by saying a decade into the open access movement. So what next? Um, again, us being Spark, three things that I would like you to think about uh, uh, as important action items for the agenda going forward. Um, no surprises, right? We need a concerted campaign on reuse rights. We've done a decent job of uh, having a campaign helping to educate authors about uh, their rights when they create an article. We need to add a, explicitly add a component in an educational campaign around readers' and users' rights. We've got to get the rights right. Um, second, uh, alms for everyone. I almost put a little Oliver Twist picture boy there, and I thought, that's in poor taste. Don't do that. Um, Article-level metrics in the research process. They're, they're brand new, they're fraught with challenges, they're fraught with potential difficulties, but they're also ripe with opportunity. And it's something that I think we as a community owe it to ourselves to, to at least explore as fully as possible to help facilitate culture change. Um, and third, and you might be surprised by this, I think we need to work like hell to get Congress to actually pass the faster bill. And I say this despite the fact that I'm ebullient that the White House actually came out and made the statement that they made and, and issued the policy directive that they issued. But I think it's critical for us to keep the pressure on Congress to pass this bill. And I say it for a very specific reason. Because a presidential directive is the preference of a president. And we want open access to be codified as the law of the land. So I would say th these are the things that we need to concentrate on going forward. In. For, forwarded, forward. They're tough challenges, they're big tasks. But based on our progress that we just talked about over the last 10 years, I'm gonna say something that I don't normally say. Rick knows this about me, I'm, I'm not an optimist. I'm a glass half empty kind of gal and what's left in the glass has probably been tampered with. Um, but I'm optimistic. So thank you for listening. the directive came out, the sponsors of FASTER from the Republican side and the Democratic side all kind of called and said, what does this mean for the bill? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? And I said, well, you know, definitely a good thing raising the, the profile. Um, uh, uh, and we need FASTER in order to codify this. The Democratic response was absolutely, and let's issue press releases saying, yippee, now let's, you know, uh, kind of perfect and, and pass FASTER. The Republican sponsors were like, well, we want to praise it, but we don't want to praise the administration too much. So we'll say, great job, but not good enough by a long shot. We need a six-month embargo period, and we need the reuse rights fully defined. There's now a little bit of a competitive um, push going on. The presidential directive gives federal agencies six months to come up with their plans for implementing policies. And what the sponsors of FASTER have already done is in the House and the Senate, they've created something that they're internally calling Team Faster between the Senate and the House. They're convening next week and they want to talk about strategies for moving the bill within six months so that they can actually influence how the agency's policies are, are going. So it's, it's the best opportunity that we're gonna have teed up in quite a long time. Yes, another question. Um, on the question of reuse rights, what's the advantage of, you know, uh, CC by SA or CC zero over like CC NC? Okay, so this is Mike's area of expertise totally, but I will say that for enabling, my, for enabling the, the Budapest definition of open access, where the only uh, role for copyright that the folks that came up with the definition of open access uh, could envision was that scholars got credit for their work. So CC BY is attribution only. You can do anything else, anyone else can do anything they want with that work as long as you as the author are appropriately credited. And that's kind of the, the, the palette that gives you and gives the community the most freedom to be as creative as possible and, and as 
unfettered as possible to use these materials. I think there are relative um, uh, advantages and disadvantages to using share alike or to using uh, no derivatives or using non, you know, CCNC, non-commercial. Um, I am going to defer to Mike to actually answer that in depth in, in his presentation. I think he'll do a much better job. I will say this, that, that How Open Is It brochure that we put out, we did it in conjunction with PLOS and the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association. And we put a CC uh, NCND license on it. And we got absolutely pilloried publicly on Twitter, uh, which was unpleasant. But um, it was an interesting thing. We thought we were protecting a definition by saying you can't take a, create a derivative product and change the words to make open access mean what you want it to mean. Um, but some, it was actually some of the found, one of the founders of PLOS and, and his brother, the Eisens, we call it being Eisen bombed publicly. You get, you get tweeted, you are wrong, you've used this the wrong way. But they were actually right in saying, look, we actually ask uh, uh, physicians and, and clinicians to publish medical protocols and definitions and use a CC by license on it. You should, you should be using this. And we said, well, we're afraid of you know, this, this definition being corrupted. And we needed Mike to explain to us that, you know what, this, the non-derivative doesn't actually protect you from that happening, that it's actually more of a trademark issue. So there are really, there's complexities in this that even those of us who think we are reasonably facile with the licensing need to get better at. And that's sort of my personal pledge this year is to, to not stumble through answers and, and to, to get clarity and, and to help the community as well figure out What's, what, why? Why is it important? What's the difference between these things? So, so this is a great conference in helping us do that. Other questions? Yes. Betsy Martins, University of Oklahoma. Since you're a glass half empty type of gal, as you said, could you talk to us a little bit about the nearest potential non-sparky future? Obviously, disaggregating content and visualizing it and doing things with it has such potential that our commercial friends would like to do this too. So could you talk a little bit about what they might be doing if our vision does not prevail? So, so you, you sound like you've met me before and know that I stay up nights like envisioning these kinds of doomsday scenarios for fun and, and pleasure. Um, I worked for one of our commercial friends Elsevier Science. Um, I was a publisher for 15 years uh, in nonprofit, the nonprofit arena almost exclusively, but I had an 11 month stint at Elsevier, which gave me a little bit of a window into the, the way thing, people thought about what the role of Elsevier was. And I came out of the American Astronomical Society with a boss who said, look, we're in business to get the science into the hands of the scientists when they want it, the way they want it, and the way that's the most useful for them in, in 1998. And that for Peter meant the, the, it wasn't even the internet yet. It was like BitNet and UUNet and still DARPAnet and our astronomers were using it. And by gum, we were not going to be the bottleneck. I went directly there to Elsevier where I had a list of 11 journals that I had to manage. And I had a, one title called Linear Algebra and its Applications that had an 18-month backlog of papers that had been accepted for publication but were just sitting there. And I went to my boss and I said, Ooh, you know, I know what to do. At the AAS, we had created this little LaTeX to S then SGML preprint process. Like, I can build one for 3000 bucks. We can get that backlog up. The editors are going to be thrilled. You know, it's not going to, my boss went, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't have $3,000 to build a preprint server. I'm like, my travel and entertainment budget that you gave me for my editors is $42,000. Like, I'll, I'll forego a steak dinner, right, in New York and do this. And he said, what do you think we're in business here to do? And I gave the get the science into the hands of science. He goes, just shook his head and he said, you know, you're here to make margin. You don't make margin at the end of the year, profit margin. You don't have a job. And I like slunk back to my desk and was like counting down. I had a year contract. I didn't make the year contract, 11 months. But the, the, the goal is profit maximization. And the, our commercial publishing friends have recognized that profit maximization is not going to be continued at the robust levels that they're currently enjoying simply by controlling access to content, to primary content. They have recognized that the next ball of wax is services on top of content. They're going to keep it gated as, as long as they can because that $9 billion is a, a generally between 30 and 40 percent profit margin producing business for them. It's a gravy train. So they're not going to give up that content gating um, voluntarily or quickly. But they are build, working to build uh, overlay tools and services onto layers of content. 
look at text mining services, data mining services, all the kinds of things that we're talking about open reuse rights enabling in an open environment to be things that they fight tooth and nail to restrict licenses to allow the general public to do, but you can only do it on their content and you have to pay them for the right to do it. I think that will be the nightmare scenario that we're fighting against, which is the other reason that I think we, 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 we got to get our, our, our law school diplomas this year in terms of reuse rights and, and figure out what we're doing on it. That was depressing. Somebody ask a question that we can end on a happy note. <laughs> Contrary to my nature, yes. To the question of profit, you mentioned that um, the open access journals are generating revenue and it's increasing greatly. How is that revenue coming in? Is it increased subscriptions to the embargoed material? Something it's else? for open access. That's a great question. So the revenue in in general from open access journals to date is uh, largely from article processing fees. Um, people have called them author charges in the past, and that's not. It's sort of a misnomer, right? They're 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 fees that are levied um, by many open access publishers, but not all open access publishers. So that you you're, you're sort of charged by the article uh, to cover the costs of p uh, copy editing, you know, quality control peer review management, all the services that a publisher can provide. They tend to range anywhere from, um, in the social sciences, Sage, Sage's uh, publication charges or, or article processing charges are pretty low. They're like 395, 695, um, all the way up to what a commercial journal will charge you, which is roughly $3,000 on the high end. The, the rational range falls somewhere in the middle. Um, I think PLOS has a great example with PLOS One where the 1350, benchmark per article is, is in, in the biological science is roughly the right charge. Um, those are the things that are generating the revenue right now. That is changing and one of the things that we didn't talk about in uh, the one of the aspects of the new journals coming onto the field that's really interesting is that two of the journals that I had up on the screen, PeerJ and eLife, have very different models for going about uh, public open access publication. So PeerJ is experimenting with a membership model where you can pay a fee of either $99 or $199 and publish as many articles as you want over the course of your lifetime. Right? They're, they're kind of this very interesting, we're going to create a, a, a membership club online around a scholarly journal or scholarly discipline. That's a whole new way. It's untested. Fascinating that the major investor for PeerJ was Tim O'Reilly the publisher of you know, the O'Reilly Manuals, O'Reilly Publications, you know, huge name. So Tim, as a publisher, sees something in there. So um, I'm, I'm reserving any kind of judgment and hopeful that we might see another um, uh, model come out. eLife is going on the assumption, making a very, um, I think, radical, and we'll see what happens over the long term, but important declarative financial assumption that the costs of communicating the results of science are part and parcel of the research process. And the journal is funded by funders of biomedical research, the Wellcome Trust, Howard Hughes, and Max Planck. And those funders have said, if we're going to fund science, we're going to fund it through to its conclusion, right? If we fund you and you don't tell anybody what you found out, our research investment isn't maximized. So we are going to cover the cost. There is no charge to, cover, to, to publish in that journal. So that's a really interesting model. Can it scale? Will it, you know, what will happen with that? I don't know. But the revenue, the, the potential uh, sources of revenue and the underlying models in the open access publishing market is beginning to diversify for the first time. And that's a positive sign in a, a market that's moving from being nascent to, you know, it, it's not mature by any stretch of the imagination, but it's, it's maybe late childhood now. So I think I'm, I'm out of time. So thank you guys very, very much. Heather, thank you. That was a terrific um, keynote to kick us off. Uh